from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today, K-State's Dallas Peterson will go over the herbicide options for spring weed control in winter wheat. He emphasizes putting those applications down as soon as field conditions allow, noting the growth stage restrictions on the various herbicide products. Then from the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McGowan will report on three recent court decisions on issues relevant to you agricultural producers, including one on a family farm trust that performed as intended despite the major disputes among the heirs. And further ahead, with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven, along with much more here on Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Thanks for tuning in. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. The winter wheat crop in Kansas is starting to come along now with warmer temperatures. Still an opportunity for weed control in several of those stands out there, but you have to be selective about the herbicide options that you might go with at this juncture in the growing season. And to cover those today, Dallas Peterson. Dallas, as you know, is a weed management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Dallas, the variable here to consider initially is the development level of that wheat, for some has come on faster than others. Well, it's certainly been quite an interesting fall and winter uh, with all the rain we got last fall and the cold, wet conditions through the winter and kind of delayed spring. And so, yeah, we have quite a range of developmental stages in our wheat, uh, ranging from some that's, you know, probably just almost coming out of the ground uh, in the northern part of the state and really hasn't taken off yet. Uh, some in the southern part of the state that maybe got planted a little bit earlier uh, is uh, starting to uh, maybe even get close to jointing. So that's quite a range of uh, stages, and that's very important when it comes to deciding what kind of weed control program you're going to have. And we'll go through several product selections and where they'll fit. Dicamba, you mentioned in a recent Agronomy e-update article on this topic, is one of those that could be earnestly looked at as an alternative. Well, it certainly is. And again, the first thing you need to determine is, you know, what are your target weeds and then decide which herbicides uh, will control those weeds. And and dicamba has uh, some real strengths in that regard. Uh, It's one of our better herbicides for kochia, for example. Also very good for wild buckwheat. Uh, The problem being that those weeds oftentimes, you know, they're coming up about the time the wheat in many cases is getting ready to joint. And uh, with dicamba, we don't want to be spraying it after that wheat starts to joint. So, again, any products that have dicamba in them, and there are quite a few out there, you know, we think of Banville and Clarity as the primary ones, but there are a lot of premixes that may have dicamba in them as well. Once that wheat gets close to jointing, uh, then we don't want to apply that anymore. Now, fortunately, it does provide a little bit of residual control. So even if some of that kochia and the buckwheat hasn't come up yet, uh, it will provide some residual control following application. So you'd want to look at a dicamba application fairly soon, it would seem. Yeah, again, depending on where you're at in the state, certainly. If you're in the southern part of the state, it may already almost be too late to, to make those dicamba applications. It's not the only product that can be applied prior to jointing. There are alternatives as well to think about, you say. Yeah, there's, uh, again, it's very specific to the herbicide that you're talking about. Dicamba, of course, is an oxen-type herbicide, and we have a couple of other oxen-type herbicides that we use in wheat, and they all have different uh, restrictions as far as what stage of growth they can be applied at. 2,4-D is is the old standby, if you will. And uh, the application stages for 2,4-D are kind of the opposite almost of dicamba. Dicamba, again, we can apply it to fairly young wheat, but we need to stop applying it once it gets close to jointing. 
Uh, with 2,4-D, we don't want to apply it until the wheat is fully tillered. And then uh, we can apply it up almost to the boot stage of growth, so uh, more of a later time frame. And some people historically have, well, they'd like to put them together because they do have different weed spectrums. Dicamba is weak on the mustards, for example, but again, good on the kochia. 2,4-D is good on the the mustards, but weak on the kochia uh, and wild buckwheat. So again, the tank mix from a a weed spectrum control is a nice tank mix, but really uh, you can only apply that when the wheat is fully tillered but before it has started to joint. And so that can be a very narrow window, if you will. And uh, again, this year we've got wheat all over the place. Uh, You just need to be aware of what you've got. Now, MCPA then is also, you know, an oxen-type herbicide, and it uh, it's probably a lot more similar to 2,4-D than it is to dicamba in terms of what weeds it controls. Again, it's good on the mustards, okay, uh, but weak on the kochia. But MCPA is a lot safer on young wheat than 2,4-D is. In fact, it's the safest across, you know, a wider range of developmental stages than either dicamba or 2,4-D. So uh, with MCPA, we can apply it uh, before the wheat is fully tillered. Uh, In fact, after it reaches about the three-leaf stage. And we can, again, apply it up until, again, about the boot stage of growth. So if you have some questions about, you know, the stage of your wheat and you're trying to decide between 2,4-D and MCPA, MCPA is definitely the safer uh, herbicide to use and really provides a very similar uh, level of control. That would be your choice then if, in fact, you have late planted wheat that is slow to tiller. Yes, definitely so. Uh, We never recommend 2,4-D in the fall, but with the late planted wheat, in the cold weather that we've had again this year, we've got a lot of wheat that still needs to do a lot of tillering this spring. So definitely in that scenario, MCPA is uh, the much better option. Just as a footnote to both of those alternatives, they are offered in two formulations. Is one more appropriate than the other for wheat at this point? Yeah, MCPA and 2,4-D both available is esters, low vol esters typically, or amines. The low vol esters, usually just a little bit more active than the amine, okay, but they are a little bit more volatile as well. Uh, amines generally pretty much non volatile. This time of the year, that's not such a big deal, to be honest with you. Volatility becomes a much bigger issue when we have higher temperatures, uh, when we get in that 80 to 85 degree and above temperature range. So that's not a big deal. The other big advantage of the ester over the amine, however, is that they are compatible with fertilizer. So if you're going to be applying your your herbicides with fertilizer, you definitely want to use the esters and not the amines. Uh, The amines oftentimes are physically incompatible, and uh, you'll have a mess to clean out uh, if you add those to the fertilizers. Important note for there are more than a few producers who have not yet top-dressed their wheat because of uncooperative field conditions. Yeah, we haven't done much of anything, to be honest. Honest with you, so everything is going to be very condensed and compressed here. Concentrating largely here on the broadleaf weeds that might pop up, but we have seen, particularly in those late coming thinner stands, grassy weeds assert themselves too, Dallas. Well, certainly, and again, with all the moisture that we got last fall and winter, that did stimulate germination of a bunch of these weeds. And you know, if you don't have a good thick wheat crop, they're going to fill in that empty space. So. Uh, we don't have nearly as many herbicides that we can use for the cheat and downy brome and joining goat grass and, and cereal rye. There's things like uh, Olympus and Powerflex uh, in general for the broma species. Beyond on clear field wheat is more specific. You can only apply that to clear field wheat. That also can control joining goat grass and rye in addition to the broma species. Those, however, most all of those need to be applied again before the wheat starts to joint from a crop safety standpoint. Uh, So you're going to get, just as we mentioned with the broadleaves, you're going to get your best control if you can get good coverage when they're still small. But from a crop tolerance standpoint, they also need to be applied before that wheat starts to joint and start to canopy. The one exception to that rule would be uh, beyond on clear field wheat if you planted a two-gene clear field wheat. Uh, One-gene clear field wheat still needs to be done before it starts to joint. Uh, Two-gene wheats, uh, you do have a little bit more safety there, and you actually can go on after the wheat starts to to joint. But again, in general, you want to do it prior to that time. I normally recommend those treatments go in in the fall, uh, if at all possible, to get your best control. 
we didn't get many of those herbicides on uh, this past fall. And again, especially with the late planted wheat, there still are plenty of opportunities to do that this spring uh, if you can get out there here in the next couple of weeks. Dallas, there are other labels that uh, can accommodate later applications, and we can talk about those. You do have reservations about going too late with any kind of herbicide. Well, certainly we want to apply them as early as practical. Again, this year, that means that we can actually get on the field and it will hold us. Uh, and again, the crop is in you know a suitable growth stage to make that application. Uh, when the weeds uh, get more advanced, especially those broadleaf weeds, once they start to bolt, okay, they become much uh, more tolerant to the herbicides. And if you're starting to develop, you know, a reasonably good canopy in your wheat, it's hard to get good coverage. So, even though some of these can be applied after the wheat starts to join. Ideally, you want to do it before that time. There are a number of other broadleaf herbicides that do have flexibility and allow you to go a little bit later, uh, you know, without having risk of injuring the crop. A lot of the sulfonylurea herbicides, for example, uh, can go on a little bit later. Some of the newer products like Husky and Culex uh, can go on a little bit later as well. But again, I will emphasize, you know, the earlier the better from a performance standpoint. All right. If you have any further questions, you can refer to the Chemical Weed Control Guide for Field Crops 2019. That is available online at agronomy.ksu.edu or inquire at your local extension office. Assess your weed situation in your wheat stands as you evaluate those in the coming weeks. But remember, many of these applications need to go on quite soon, as a matter of fact, as the label stipulations would indicate. As always, Dallas, we appreciate the input. Thank you. My pleasure. That on paying attention to the growth stage for spring herbicide decisions on wheat. Dallas Peterson, Weed Management Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. And incidentally, there is an article by that same title on this topic in the March 29th Agronomy e-update newsletter. As always, to access that, go to agronomy.ksu.edu. And we'll return with more after this break. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Welcome back. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we've quite a spectrum of agricultural law cases to share with you. This time around, our regular visit with a professor of agricultural law and taxation at the Washburn University School of Law, Roger McCohen, alongside. Roger, actually three cases we'd like to get into today, and the first of which, well, it's another trust case where uh, it's fraught with family turmoil, arguing over the structure of a trust and the continuation of it. Oh, yeah, that's correct, Eric. Uh, and this comes from the state of Wyoming, and it's a recent case involving a, a family trust. And even though there was estate planning that was done, that doesn't mean that you may not have some family problems uh, and fights over um, uh, disposition of assets. In fact, uh, my blog post earlier this week that I devoted to this topic, and that had to do with wills and trusts and undue influence and testamentary capacity. But we've got a something similar in this Wyoming case involving a trust. And and there had been a lot of litigation in this family over a period of years. And, and this case actually had been before the Wyoming Supreme Court on multiple occasions. And uh, what you had was a family trust that was created in 1989. It was amended in 1995. And the amendment said that uh, there was going to be a successor trustee in the event, of course, that the initial trustee could not serve. And it always required the service of two trustees, which is, in many instances, a good idea. We're trying to avoid problems 
problems, and so we want to have uh, some kind of consensus among multiple people with respect to decisions concerning trust property. Not a bad idea, a good way to go. Uh, but this created a marital trust for the survivor of mom and dad, and and there was a revised buyout provision. So they're thinking ahead here. You know, we want we've got some heirs that aren't won't necessarily be interested in the farm or the ranch. We've got some that will be. So we want to be able to buy out the kids that aren't interested in in farming, so they get money, and the ones that are interested in farming or ranching actually get to farm the property. So. I can tell they've thought this through. And Good intentions. Some, yeah, anyway. we've got some decent provisions in that trust. This is the way that we suggest many of these situations be handled. You got five kids here, um, and mom and dad and the kids all made contributions to the trust. And then, upon one of the parents in 2007, one of the children was appointed as co-trustee. Well, you've got a first lawsuit that arose when the surviving parent's property was not conveyed to the trust, and then again, involving removal of the trustees and an appointed trustee. Um, so you've got you, problems with the trustees. You've got problems with property, farm property, ranch property, not getting contributed to the trust. And so there's a lawsuit to try to have one of the trustees removed. We've got uh, administration difficulties. You've got family dysfunction. And the long story short was the claim was, well, the trust no longer serves its intended purpose and therefore it should be terminated and the property distributed outside of the terms of the trust. So that was the contention that was brought before the court. And uh, this marched right up the ladder eventually to the Wyoming Supreme Court. But what were the uh, views of the court initially here on this? Well, the court looked at this and to cut through a whole bunch of issues to get to the one point that I, I want to talk about here. The court cut through a lot of stuff and they said, look, the trust was created for the purpose of consolidating farm and ranch holdings. That is a legitimate purpose. I'm not going to terminate the trust simply because uh, you people are fighting and claiming that the trust has no purpose anymore, so therefore distribute the property free of trust to us as the kids. The court said no. The purpose of that trust was to put the farm and ranch property together to have a way to administer it, and that purpose still is served. Uh, you have the property contained in a trust. You can appoint that trustee to administer that trust property to continue to fulfill that purpose. And so they didn't uh, terminate the trust. The trust still is there. The court will appoint someone to uh, administer the property in accordance with the parents' terms that they put in the trust to, to fulfill their intent. And that points out uh, a good purpose to using trust in terms of estate planning. One of those is to consolidate your business interests together and have someone manage that property after you're gone or in this instance after you and your spouse are gone. And and this withstood all that family dysfunction. So this trust performs as intended, in the despite long, all the Yeah, in the end, ragging. in the long run, it did. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the, the good news coming out of this, and, and it, uh, in that respect, helped to uh, minimize family problems. This next case, well, <laughs> it's about an insurance policy, and it gets to the point of details matter when making a claim on that insurance policy. This wrapped around a, uh, a power outage that was caused by wildlife, Roger. This is the case of the fried squirrel. <laughs> And uh, what happened was you had a squirrel that got into the plaintiff's electrical transformer at their power plant and managed to walk onto the grounded frame and a bare cable clamp at the same time, and that was charged with 7,200 volts of electricity, and so uh, fried the squirrel pretty well and created an electrical arc that destroyed the unit along with the squirrel, and that caused over $200,000 worth of damage to the transformer and other electrical equipment. Well, the company that owned that filed a claim with their insurance insurer for coverage on that. And uh, the insurer said, no, read your policy. And that policy says, uh, quote, we do not pay for loss or damage caused directly or indirectly by one or more of certain excluded causes or, or events. So the question before the court was, what does that mean? Is the squirrel an intervening cause that uh, does not trip the exclusionary language in the policy? Or is that language sufficient to say uh, when we don't cover loss or damage caused directly or indirectly, is the indirect cause of the squirrel mean that the exclusionary language uh, applies and you don't have coverage? And when this got to the courts, actually the the position of the insurance company was affirmed because it was very clear that in these cases, anything other than lightning causing that outage uh, would be 
not coverable. Yeah, that was exactly correct. The court, in looking at the squirrel caused electrical arc, said that the squirrel and the electrical arcing were not two independent causes of the loss. Uh, they were kind of the same thing. And because they were not independent causes, then that exclusionary language applied, which had the language in it that uh, we don't cover loss or damage caused directly or indirectly by certain excluded causes or events. And as you said, the only thing that was um, covered loss in that instance was damage due to lightning. And so um, there was no coverage in this situation, which comes back to something we've said many times, and that is read policies very carefully. If you have any concern about what the language might mean or you don't understand it, ask your insurance agent uh, as well as a well-trained attorney that practices in insurance litigation so that they can give you their advice as to what any particular policy language means so that you might have a chance to renegotiate that. This made it all the way up to the Iowa Supreme Court, which affirmed Mm -hmm. the insurance company's position on this. So read the details of your policy. Yep, that squirrel was a direct cause uh, to the ARC, and that was excluded from coverage in the policy. The last case we'll cover today is out of the state of Nebraska. And uh, this case tested a Nebraska agency's authority to enforce groundwater use regulations. What was the story here? Uh, We've heard a lot about uh, these types of issues uh, in Kansas over the years, probably the past decade, 10, 15 years, because of the litigation that went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court involving Kansas, Nebraska, and Colorado. Well, this is kind of in the same area in Nebraska that is involved or has been in the past involved in that litigation. It's a little bit north of the area in Nebraska that led to that litigation involving the three states. This involves the Lower Loop River Natural Resource District, which is just a bit north of of the Republican River. Of course, coming out of that compact between the three states, Nebraska has um, specific rules for groundwater usage for their farmers up there. And uh, so they have an elaborate set of regulations that uh, regulate issues uh, that farmers might encounter that would involve contribution of groundwater contamination. And what farmers have to do that are covered by that uh, regulation in the state is they have to file annual reports as to the crops that they plant, the chemicals that they apply, the water tests that they perform every year, and other related information. Well, you get a farmer up there that didn't file the necessary annual reports in accordance with state uh, regulations and state law, didn't indicate his actual crop yield, didn't sign the documents that he did file. He filed eventually late failed on that document to indicate his crop yields, didn't provide his irrigation data, didn't provide nitrogen application numbers, and again, didn't sign or date the um, filings that he did make. So the state comes in, notifies him um, that he's deficient, held a hearing, issued a cease and desist order that required him to stop groundwater irrigation usage for four years and to submit properly completed forms for the years that he hadn't submitted properly completed forms and then always submit proper forms for future years. Well, he didn't like that. He appealed that administrative order, exhausts his administrative remedies, gets into court. The court didn't like what he had to say at all. And, and, and basically, he, part of what he was arguing was that his property rights were being taken and he needed to be compensated by that. The court said, no, this is a legitimate exercise of the state's power to regulate groundwater usage. There is a public purpose to this. This is not a taking. and You've got to comply with these rules. So you know, the lesson is... Is in a lot of the states west of the Missouri River, groundwater usage by farmers is very important. It's highly regulated now. It's going to continue to be that issue. And this is one of these cases where the court said the state has the legitimate authority to do that. These are the kinds of cases that Roger routinely covers on his blog. Do have a look at that. It's great reading at washburnlaw.edu slash W-A-L-T-R. And Roger, as always, a pleasure. Thank Thank you, Eric. A professor of agricultural law and taxation at the Washburn University School of Law and a regular guest here, Roger McCohen. You're listening to Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. 
This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Broadcasting from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And next up for you, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. U.S. agricultural lobbyists are out in force imploring of President Trump not to close the Mexican border, with U.S. dairy groups leading that charge. The U.S. Dairy Export Council warned that a southern border closure would add to that industry's economic slump caused by retaliatory duties imposed after the president slapped tariffs on trading partners, including China and the European Union. Mexico is the largest export market for U.S. dairy, importing near nearly $1.4 billion worth of dairy products in 2018. Dairy exporters already are suffering from diminished access to export markets due to high tariffs and lack of progress on U.S. trade agreements. Those are the words of the president and CEO of the group, Tom Vilsack, former USDA Agriculture Secretary. He went on to say that closing the U.S. southern border to Mexico would be, as he put it, a gut punch that could set the industry back by a decade or two. Mexico is the largest customer of U.S. milk powder, cheese, and butterfat, according to the Dairy Council. Now, yesterday, USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue was asked what it would mean for agriculture if the president carried through on his threat to close the border with Mexico. It's uh, not helpful. Uh, It can be... uh certainly harmful uh, from a trade perspective if that uh, if trade is included in that shutdown uh, i would like to see uh, certainly uh, uh, it not uh, not affect agricultural trade in that regard whether it's rail or truck but uh, that may be wishing for too much u.s secretary of agriculture sonny purdue Farm credit leaders told the House Agriculture Appropriations Subcommittee yesterday that the Farm Credit Administration is as prepared as it can be to help farmers weather the current challenging economic times from continually declining farm income and stagnant commodity prices. But they added that individual farm situations are dire on the ground in Midwestern states such as Nebraska and Iowa, where flooding has devastated agriculture, and in places heavy in dairy production such as Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Witnesses told the committee that now is the time for lawmakers to pass additional disaster funding that comes after the Senate on Monday failed in a procedural vote to end a debate on an emergency disaster bill. The $13.5 billion bill included aid for the Midwestern states that have been hit by flooding and $600 million for Puerto Rico's food stamp program. However, Democrats said more aid is needed in Puerto Rico. The floods in Nebraska and Iowa have caused damage to agriculture in excess of $1 billion, that number is likely to grow. The president and CEO of Farm Credit Services of America, Frontier Farm Credit, based in Omaha, Mark Jensen, said that Nebraska farmers face other challenges on top of disaster. He said that farmers and ranchers continue to grapple with a very challenging environment, commodity prices having fallen, remaining low for the past several years, while the costs associated with raising crops has remained high. Many row crop farmers, he says, have found profits elusive and face multiple years of losses with similar circumstances projected for the 2019 crop year. There is little chance, he says, of a quick commodity price rebound, barring some unexpected changes in commodity supply and demand. He said that they are at Farm Credit working hard to support customers through this cycle, and despite the current situation, they continue to have a positive long-term outlook for U.S. agriculture. Even as Nebraska producers try to pick up the pieces after the flood, Plenty of concern about additional flooding from expected snowmelt and spring storms, Jensen noted. He added, it'll likely take months to fully assess the damage, but the need for assistance, he says, is immediate. Producers affected by the floods will be qualified for restoration assistance, according to Jensen. That includes interest rate discounts, interest-only payment programs, and installment loans for refinancing working capital losses from operating losses, uh, operating loans, that is, created by the weather-related disaster. 
Foster. He says when it comes down to the farm economy, most farmers and livestock producers have already done what they can to adjust their operations, including lowering production costs, deferring payments, and restructuring debt. U.S.-China trade talks continue this week in Washington. Here's an update from the USDA's Stephanie Ho. Ag Secretary Sonny Perdue welcomed the continuation of U.S.-China trade talks this week. The good news is I'm optimistic that we're still talking. He spoke to reporters during a visit to Purdue University one day before Chinese Vice Premier Liu He is set to resume talks with U.S. officials in Washington. This is an emissary that President Xi has sent here that can speak for him. Obviously, I think the finality of this deal will be done between President Trump and President Xi, as it should be. He acknowledged farmers' worries as legitimate anxiety. What I've told the president before is that farmers are true patriots, and they are, and they're some of his biggest supporters, and they've been very loyal, but it's difficult to pay the bank with patriotism. He added there are outstanding enforceability issues. Part of the problem is that China has indicated before in the past they were willing to do some things and didn't live up to that. When they entered the WTO, they made some commitments that we don't believe they've lived up to. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Twelve chefs from Kansas City and California gathered in late March in Napa, California, for an intense two-day beef culinary immersion workshop, as they called it. Scarlett Higgins tells us here that the Chekhov-sponsored event was coordinated by the Kansas and California Beef Councils. The culinary workshop focused on two areas, beef production and beef's flavor dynamics in world cuisine. National Cattlemen's Beef Association Senior Director of Sustainable Beef Production Research, Sarah Place, led a discussion on beef sustainability, and California rancher Celeste Satrini gave an overview of life on a cattle ranch. Chef Barry Strand, a member of NCBA's culinary team, identified beef opportunity cuts such as tri-tip, flat iron, and petite tender, and highlighted menu applications for each. Following the educational seminars each day, chefs created beef menu items based on what they had learned. Each dish received a culinary critique on taste and food styling by chef instructors at the Culinary Institute of America. The group also toured Sonoma Mountain Herefords and Cundy Family Winery. Keith Bryant, cattle operations manager at Reeve Cattle Company near Garden City, also attended the workshop to engage with chefs and answer additional beef production questions. The culinary immersion experience was a valuable way for chefs to learn and explore how beef can fit on a modern, global menu that meets today's diverse consumer palate. It also allowed for conversations about beef production in general that will pay dividends as chefs interact with consumers. I'm Scarlett Hagens. Those are today's agricultural news headlines. Interested in subscribing to our podcast service? Go to agtoday.net to do so. agtoday.net. This is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. The talk of the village was that the minister had requested the tree to be cut down because the tree was dead. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. The other day I read that Vincent van Gogh, the painter, at one time lived in the small Dutch village of Noonan. He lived there with his parents from December 1883 until November 1885. At that stage in his career, he was in his 30s. And there he painted the famous painting of the potato eaters. He lived in the parsonage situated near the center of the town close to the old church. In 2012... The minister of that time 
was living in the same old house. I'm sure the kitchen had been modernized like in my family's house years ago in the old city of Groningen. That house was a solid structure from 1600, however, with all the modern conveniences. It was beautifully restored and maintained with character. Back to Nunen, which lays in the province of Brabant, the Netherlands. Because the famous painter Vincent van Gogh once lived in that old parsonage, people tend to drift to the village and want to see where he lived and worked. In desperation, a notice has been placed beside the front doorbell that no house tours were given. It is written in Dutch and English. However, the writer of the book I was reading did ring the bell to visit. I presume he called before he rang. The door was open and he was welcomed in. The reason of his visit was that in the garden of the parsonage stands a pear tree, which is said to have been painted by Van Gogh. The talk of the village was that the minister had requested the tree to be cut down, because the tree was dead, dead as a doornail. The community argued, no way, that tree is a historic cultural treasure. It has been argued that for Van Gogh to have painted the pear tree around 1884, the tree under discussion should have been bigger. I think the age of the tree can be easily verified by taking a coring. It's now a dead tree. From its description, a very attractive dead tree. And dead trees, like dormant trees in winter, can be very attractive with their silhouette against the sky, day or night, with full moon or snow. The small church still stands in Noonan, as well as seen on another painting. You can see the people huddled in scarves walking to and entering the building to listen to Vincent Father's sermon. I can understand the feeling for a dead tree which Vincent van Gogh might have painted. He also painted flowering peach trees more than once. We have a reproduction of a peach tree in bloom, signifying spring. It hangs in our downstairs stairwell. I told my then girlfriend, now my wife, to buy it when she wrote me in Australia that she had seen it hanging in an art gallery in Utrecht, where she lived. I sent her the money, and she bought it and hung it in her room, the flowering peach tree that was a life tree with lots of promise, never been disappointed. I'm thinking about these two stories because I noticed a row of trees being taken down on campus, and as far as I could see, the trees were not dead. Actually, the trees were ready to bud out, and I wondered why they were cut down. A whole row of them. I did some asking and some searching on the computer. It seems that these ash trees were taken down as a prevention against the threat of emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer is a pest of ash trees native to Asia. It was first discovered in North America in 2002 in Detroit, Michigan area. Since then it has killed millions of ash trees and caused thousands more to be removed to slow its spread. Of course, I had heard about emerald ash borer before, and it reminds me of Dutch elm disease. Millions and millions of dollars have been spent on research, and the result? We still have the disease. I've always thought to blame the Dutch was a mistake. It was the fine furniture industry which imported veneer logs, those logs which were marked by the weevil which dug and survived under the bark doing its job. Our famous L streets are gone, except in paintings, old photos, and of course, we live, or some of us do, on Elm Street. The fact is, the emerald ash borer has been introduced. Its spread is being monitored by setting traps, girdling trees with special paper traps. The beetle is 
in Kansas. It has spread to many areas of the country by campers who, not knowing, load up with good home firewood to burn on their first night away from home 500 miles away. The next morning, they move on another 500 miles, hauling infected wood. They often camp in wooded lots, so there you have it. My opinion? One way or another, we had better learn to accept another tree pest. Yes, don't haul infested wood around. In time, a long time, there will be an ash tree which will show resistance, and that tree will thrive. It's nature. As far as cutting down still standing healthy trees as a precaution against spreading, I wouldn't do it. This last Saturday, I was asked that question when a friend asked my opinion in regard to a beautiful ash sapling, volunteer coming up in his yard. I told him, enjoy it while it lives and admire it. It's like shooting people so they don't get cancer. It doesn't work. Love them. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. Our time's away for today. As always, thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.